Continuing, I have but one last question for you. Would you like to take the blue pill or the red pill? You take the blue pill, you exit this browser, and you go back to whatever it was that you were doing. You take the red pill and you keep watching and I give you the secret to all you want in life. It's truly not so profound. It's not anything new. It's about as old as this allegory itself. The secret of life is a thing. That's how winning is done! This team, we fight for that itch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to peace for that itch. We claw with our fingernails for that itch. This is where we hold them. This is where we fight. Hello, beautiful people. As I am Matthew Harris, this must be yet another edition of the Matt's Mindset Podcast. And today, we'll be discussing nothing more or less than the secret to getting all you want from life. As always, we'll start with a quote. If I have seen further than most, it has been because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Imagine that there are people living in a cave deep underground. The cavern has a mouth that opens to the light above and a passage exists from this all the way down to the people. They have lived here from infancy with their legs and necks bound in chains. They cannot move. All they can do is stare directly forward as the chains stop them from turning their heads around. Imagine that far below and behind them blazes a great fire between the, this fire and the captives is a low partition that is erected along a path. Something like puppeteers used to conceal themselves during their shows. Look and you will see other people carrying objects back and forth along the partition. Things of every kind, images of people and animals carved in stone and wood and other materials. Some of these people speak while others remain silent. Now tell me, do you think it's possible that these captives have ever seen anything other than the shadows their whole life? Certainly not, his companion responded, for they have been restrained their whole lives with their heads facing forward. And so these captives would naturally give names to things that they were actually able to see, and they would feel as if this was their reality. And now think about what would happen if they were released from these chains and misconceptions. Imagine that only one among them was set free from his shackles and he immediately ma was made to stand up and bend his neck around to take steps and to gaze upward toward the fire. And all of this was painful, of course, because the glare from the light made him unable to see the objects anymore that cast the shadows he once beheld. What do you think his reaction would be if someone informed him that everything that he had formerly known was illusion and delusion? But now he was able to take fewer steps closer to reality, oriented now toward things that were more authentic and able to see more truly. And even further, if one were to direct his attention to the artificial figures passing to and fro and ask him what their names were, would this man not be at a loss to do so, having only before seen shadows? Would he rather believe that the shadows he formerly knew were more real than the objects he was now being shown? Now, if we were forced to look directly at the firelight, wouldn't his eyes be pained? Wouldn't he turn away and run back to those things which he normally perceived and understood them more defined and clearer than the things he is now being shown and brought to his attention? Now, let's say that he is forcibly dragged up the steep cliff of the cavern and, and finally firmly held and forced to stand in the light of the sun. Don't you think he would be agitated 
and he even began to complain. Under that light, wouldn't his eyes be nearly blinded, unable to discern any of those things that we call ourselves real? It would take time, I suppose, for him to get used to seeing the higher things. In the beginning, he would only begin to be able to trace the shadows, then reflections of people and other things in the water. Next, he would come to see the things themselves. Then he would behold the heavenly bodies and the heaven itself by night, shooting stars, seeing the light of the stars and the moon with greater ease than the sun and its light by day. And then I think he would be at last able to gaze upon the sun itself, neither as reflected in the water nor as a phantom image in some other place, but in its own place as it really is. And now he will begin to reason he will find that the sun is the source of the seasons and the years and the governor of all visible things and ultimately the origin of everything he had previously known that being the case should he remember his fellow prisoners in their original dwelling what was accepted as wisdom in that setting don't you imagine he would consider himself fortunate for this transformation and feel pity for the captives now then suppose that there were honors and awards among the captives which they granted as prizes to one another for being the best at recognizing the various shadows passing by or deciphering their patterns, their order, and their relationships among them, and therefore best at predicting what shadow would be seen next. Do you believe that our liberated man would be much concerned with such honors, or that he would be jealous of those who received them? Or that he would strive to be like those who were lauded by the captives, enjoyed pride or place among them? Or would he rather take Homer's view and rather wish in earthly life to be a humble serf of the landless man and suffer whatever he had to instead of holding the views of the captives and returning to that state of being? Well, here's something else to consider. If such a man would, sun would suddenly go from the sunlight to once more descend to his original circumstances, wouldn't his vision be obscured by darkness? And so, Let's say he is with the captives and gets put into the position of interpreting the wall shadows. His eyes are still adjusting back to the darkness, and it may take a while for, before they are. Would he then not become a laughingstock? Wouldn't they say, you have returned from your adventure up there with ruined eyes? Wouldn't they, would they not say that the ascent had been a waste of time? And if they had the opportunity, do you suppose that they might try to raise their hands against him and kill this person who is trying to liberate them to a higher plane? Then, my friend, this image applies to everything we've been discussing. It compares the visible world to the underground cavern and the power of the sun to the fire that burned within. You won't misunderstand me if you connect the captive's ascent to the ascent of the soul to the intelligible world. This is how I believe, and I share it at your wish, though heaven knows whether it is true or not. Regardless, it appears to me that the realm of what can be known, that the idea of the good is discovered last of all, and it is only perceived with great difficulty. But when it is seen, it leads us directly to the finding that it is the universal cause of all that is right and beautiful. It is the source of visible light and the master of the same. And in the intelligible world, it is the master of truth and reason. And whoever in public or private would behave in a sensible way will keep this idea in focus. This passage is from Plato's Republic, which was published around 390 BC. I don't, I don't even know if you'd say published, but it was certainly completed around 390 BC. And it is known as the famous allegory of the cave, this uh, translation having come from uh, Harvard University. In it, Socrates is describing to Plato's brother, Glaucon, that we all resemble the captives who are chained deep within the cavern and who do not realize that there is more to reality than the shadows that they see on the wall. It has inspired countless works of fiction and philosophy, recent examples including the Matrix franchise and the Truman Show. So before continuing, I have but one last question for you. Would you like to take the blue pill or the red pill? You take the blue pill, you exit this browser, and you go back to whatever it was that you were doing. You take the red pill and you keep watching, and I give you the secret to all you want in life. It's truly not so profound, 
it's not anything new. It's about as old as this allegory itself. The secret of life is that there are themes of consciousness. Life is ever changing and unpredictable. Due to entropy, there's always a degree of disorder and randomness in the system at any given time. And due to the interpretation of the theory of quantum mechanics, known as the many worlds interpretation, a wave function describing a quantum system does not collapse into a single outcome upon measurement, but rather branches into different universes, each corresponding to a different possible outcome of that measurement. And according to string theory, the tiny pieces that make up everything in the world, including you and me, are actually little strings. These tiny strings are so small that nobody has ever seen them directly, but theoretical physicists have come up with this idea by studying the way that the world behaves. It's like playing a guitar. When you pluck a string, it vibrates and creates sound. In the same way, these tiny strings can vibrate in different ways to make different particles like electrons and quarks, which are the building blocks of atoms. So our bodies are made up of atoms, which are composed of quarks and electrons, which are made up of tiny little strings vibrating at certain frequencies to produce certain outcomes. And all possible outcomes are possible, as the quantum system does not collapse into a single outcome. So the secret to life is to embody the vibration of love and gratitude. If you can embody the vibration of love and gratitude as often as you can, not only will you be happy and satisfied, because you will feel love and gratitude on a daily basis, but you will begin to attract and be attracted to people, places, and experiences which are also loving and satisfying. There are 15 themes of consciousness in total. There are eight limiting themes of consciousness, which are, in ascending order, shame, guilt, judgment, hopelessness, grief, fear, desire, anger, and pride. These themes are the limiting themes of suffering as defined by both the Buddha and Jesus of Nazareth. If you can transcend these limiting themes of consciousness, you can ascend to the self-empowered themes of courage, neutrality, willingness, acceptance, reason, and logic. These are the themes of the Enlightenment zeitgeist, embraced by thinkers like John Locke, Voltaire, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Immanuel Kant and then later embraced in the modernist movement in which rejected the traditional values and conventions of the Victorian era, instead embraced a willingness to experiment with new forms of expression using their reason and logic. If you can further transcend these self-empowered themes of consciousness, then you arrive at the transcendent themes of ecstasy. Freedom, happiness, love, and inner peace. These were the original values of the postmodern movement, which rejected the modernist interpretation of reason and logic being man's highest virtue, and instead tried to focus on peace, love, happiness, and inner freedom. Think of John Lennon, Martin Luther King Jr., Bob Dylan, and other artists of the counterculture movement. So that's all great, right? <laughs> that's the uh, secret to life, is just try to be as happy and grateful as possible at all times. You choose to embody love and gratitude and nothing can ever go wrong again, right? Well, here's the red pill truth. Once you choose to embody this higher consciousness, most of the things that are currently in your life will begin to feel incredibly chaotic. You have to unshock yourself from the cave and begin to see things the way that they truly are. As you raise the frequency of your vibration, your cells are vibrating at. You notice the chaos all around you. Like the captive in the cave who is now free, your eyes begin to hurt when you look at the torch high above you. Things have always been this chaotic. You just didn't notice because your internal vibration was aligned with the outside world. But now you are much more peaceful, much more grateful, much more loving. And you are able to observe the chaos just as you are able to observe your swirling thoughts and emotions when you are in a state of meditation. Also, now that you are embodying peace, love, and gratitude, this is like an alarm that goes off. If you want to be pop culture about it, Agent Smith is alerted that you're trying to break free of the matrix. If you want to be religious about it, 
the enemy, the devil or Satan is alerted. If you want to be a humanist or a modernist about it, it has been described as the fat, blind inertia. It has been called many things over the millennia. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. I've been around for a long, long year. Stolen a million man's soul and faith. I was around when Jesus Christ had his moment of doubt and pain. Made damn sure that Pilate washed his hands and sealed his fate. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guessed my name. Sympathy for the Devil, The Rolling Stones, 1968. Once you embody this state of gratitude and love, you are aligning yourself with the consciousness of God, the Christ consciousness. And so the enemy begins to try to take you out of that vibration, usually in the form of obstacles or people. And these obstacles or people can be very alluring. They'll look good, they'll smell good, they'll present you an offer. And sometimes the offer is a good offer, you know, quote unquote, good offer. Could be more money or crazy lustful sex like you've never known. But the offer will take you out of the frequency of love and gratitude that you've tried to cultivate for yourself and decided that you want to move towards. And it'll try to pull you back towards one of the lower frequencies. Like Satan's three temptations of Christ, his temptation to Jesus to turn stones into bread because Jesus had the power to do so. And then the temptation to throw him off the temple because he knew that God would protect him. And a temptation to lower his consciousness and worship himself, Satan. And, and in return, Satan will give him any earthly pleasure that he desired, which were, of course, Satan's to give. I think that's a bit understated in the interpretation because in the book of Job, when God asked Satan where he was, Satan replies, I was walking around my estate. The kingdoms of the world in the lower frequencies of consciousness are Satan's to give. The limiting themes are his domain. Juxtapose this to the three temptations of the Buddha. According to the tradition of Buddhism, Siddhartha Gautama was, test, was tempted and tested by the evil spirit Mara when he was attempting to achieve his own enlightenment. He was tempted with the visions of beautiful women, the limiting theme of desire. Then the limiting theme of fear threatened him with armies of demons and monsters, and the limiting theme of hopelessness, which challenged his right to enlightenment and the validity of his own teachings. And only by overcoming these three temptations did Siddhartha Gautama become the Buddha and only by overcoming his three temptations did Jesus of Nazareth become Jesus Christ. These stories are not accidental. They fit perfectly into Joseph Campbell's theory of the monomyth. Joseph Campbell was a contemporary comparative mythology and comparative religion professor whose famous book, A Hero with a Thousand Faces, inspired George Lucas to write Star Wars. Most, if not all, works of storytelling throughout all time include the hero's journey. The hero's journey is an inherently human experience, just as storytelling is an inherently human experience. Every story from the Epic of Gilgameth to the Odyssey, to the New Testament, to Star Wars, to Harry Potter are either manifestations of or reactions against the hero's journey. I will put a chart up to show you, but the hero's journey starts with a departure the ordinary world, the cave, the call to adventure, he's unshackled. They're refusing the call to adventure, the pain. Meeting the mentor, in Star Wars this could be when Luke Skywalker meets Obi-Wan. The crossing the threshold when he leaves Tatooine. The initiation, the tests, allies, and enemies. The approach to the innermost cave. So the test allies and enemies would be meeting Han and meeting eventually meeting Leia and getting his allies and of course meeting the enemies starting to come up against opposition. The approach to the innermost cave would be when he's in the they have to rescue the princess and then they're in the trash compactor. The ordeal would be when he has to fly towards the Death Star and has to face those challenges and skim along that trench. And then of course, when he has to take a leap of faith, 
when he has to decide that he's going to not rely on rationality or the targeting computers, when he has to use the force, when he has to believe in himself, when he has to listen to source, and then when he uses the force and blows up the Death Star. And then the reward would be when they escape with the princess and blow up the Death Star. Then you, of course, you have the return, which is when he returns to the cave. So the road back, resurrection, resurrection, return with the elixir. And this would be more in the later movies, especially in the following movie, which would be the road back, which is after he's blown up the Death Star, he goes back, they regroup. And then the resurrection would be when he's trapped in Cloud City and he falls to into the abyss, only to resurrect stronger than he was before. Returning with the elixir, being a strong, powerful Jedi Knight, and being able to build his own lightsaber, his training complete, now able to fulfill his destiny. So the secret to living a happy and fulfilling life is to cultivate a mindset of love and gratitude so you can vibrate on that frequency and attract others who vibrate on that same frequency into your life. But by doing so, you are making yourself a hero of your own life, as you should be. And as a result, you will have to undertake this hero's journey. As you climb out of the cave and see things as they truly are, you'll find it's not an easy journey, which is why I felt compelled to start making these videos to help those who have decided to embark on this journey. Because we all embark on this journey, whether we are aware of it or not. And so, light and love, my friends. Go in peace to love and serve. You should know you can go where you, you want to go, I can take you